see so. Oh, it's fabulous! A strike to get you up off your feet! Hello, welcome to Seagull Social Season 4, Episode 11. And once again, it's a podcast without Ben or Maz or me in one pod. It seems to happen every single week at this point. So this time we've got neither of them. Um, <laughs> it's all right. We've got we've got a couple of last minute um, replacements again. And thank you, boys, for coming on, Adam and Louis. Adam, mate, you're at the game. I saw you two rows behind me, but you didn't <laughs> see me. Uh, I felt like a fanboy looking behind me about eleven before you would not even notice me. But, um, sorry, mate, <laughs> sorry, <mate. laughs> no, <laughs> it's funny. Um, how are you after? What I think was a it was a more positive second half anyway yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I think it was a it was a decent game. I mean. Um, Nice for me. I only have to nip down the road. I'm living in Manchester at the moment, so it's lovely for me. Um, so I was able to be home very quickly after the full time whistle. Um, but yeah, it's one of those games. Like it was always going to be tough. I think no Brighton fan went in with the genuine belief we were going to win. So uh, to go and like in the end, kind of put up a decent fight in the second half. You know, not a bad, not a bad day to be honest. Yeah, and Louis, mate, yourself. I mean, it's in your second time on the pod, isn't it? Um, but <laughs> talking about the yeah, it is yeah. not ideal, but. Yeah, your your thoughts yesterday, and how are you doing, mate? Yeah, no, I'm not doing too bad. I managed to catch um, pretty much the whole game. Actually, I was um, down watching my local club playing, and then we kicked off just afterwards. First half was pretty pedestrian; didn't look like we had much of a shout. And then, yeah, second half we really climbed back into it, and it could have been a draw, like you said. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, first half. I mean, we need to talk about the obvious. I think, but. It's it's one of them where you see the team sheet, you see no fullback, and then you see Doku and you see etc. on that team, um, and you, and I, I, it wasn't instant worry. <clears throat> I think I, I, to put it really lightly, it was an instant worry. Um, Doku was as good as everyone thought he was, and Foden as well. I think Foden can do things with a football that no one else in England can, um, and, and and I'm including Bellingham in that because he's he's very different to Bellingham, obviously. But I think that Foden's skill set is just ridiculous and we saw it yesterday um he seems to really turn it on against us and uh, him him and Doku were just causing us absolute headaches but I, I, I don't want to call him out because I, I felt really bad for him yesterday because you could just see it was not his day uh, at all and at the end of the day he's a 37 year old midfielder being put into right back he doesn't want to be there um but yeah James Milner got absolutely rinsed <laughs> by Doku and I mean rinsed by Doku big time um, completely the the whole game plan from from the get go really. Um, Adam, your your thoughts on not just Milner but that that right side was just so invisible, wasn't it, against Doku that, in that first uh, forty minutes? Yeah, completely. And like it was so obvious from literally the second the game started, like that was their tactic: getting the ball out to the wing. You know, Doku. I think Foden on the other side staying really wide, trying to spread right and out, and it was just a nightmare for particularly Milner, like. The ball would get knocked out to him and then it'd be a Dinger and Milner kind of trying to double up. But neither of them really getting that close to him because obviously they didn't really want to get skinned by him. So it sort of like would be dropping off, dropping off, dropping off. And then he just, you know, I, to be honest, I, I hadn't seen loads of Docky, but what a player. Like he was absolutely electric. And you think, I mean, actually for that first goal, I was watching it back this morning um, just to try and kind of jog my memory a little bit. And actually it was it wasn't actually Milner who got skinned for that. It was actually gross. And then kind of Milner made a bit of an error when, when kind of Docky got through. But he was just skinning everyone down City's left-hand side. Um, felt bad for Milner. And to be honest, I think Veltman played pretty well when he came on, kind of shored, thing up, shored things up and uh, kind of we got grew back into the game a little bit. But yeah, horrible afternoon for James Milner. Horrible. Yeah, it's it's been an ongoing debate. I mean, I don't know about you, Louis, but Veltman... Why? If I mean, I don't, I don't understand why. Maybe he's resting in for Ajax, but he hasn't been on internationals unless I've got unless I've completely missed something, and he's not really played completely consistency anyway. Why on earth is Gerald Veltman not starting him right back there? I don't think I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Am I muted? Yeah, is that, is yeah, that what was going on? <laughs> I think you were muted, Louis. Uh, okay, right, right. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was sorry. Me, I don't think right, I hear I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll start from the top again, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go um, yeah, no, so I think there was probably probably two things um, I think it comes down to uh, with picking Veltman. I think it firstly comes down to whoever he's up against, like the personnel. Um, like the way he dealt with Zaha last year. That was exceptional, and you know the way he deals with tricky wingers, the ones who try and take you on one on one, he's absolutely unbelievable at that. But you'll find when people try and work around him, like play passes around him, he's a bit slower to turn. I think possibly, um, where you know someone like Lamptey would be a little bit more um, effective, I suppose. Um, and secondly, I think it's just maybe making sure that everyone stays fit. To me, he feels like more of a... He's certainly not a wing-back, like we saw under Potter. It just it just doesn't work. He's more of a defensive-minded uh, right-back. So I think when you, you have Estipinian, for example, who loves to push on much, much further, and you'll even find that with Solly. Um, you know, it's a real shame that he got injured yesterday. But when we've got that attacking shape... You know, Veltman will will tuck in, and it will allow whoever's on the left to just carry on forwards. So I think again, it's that it's that idea of the personnel that that makes you think. Mm. You know, Veltman would be the one to start in this game, but I still think he's probably probably the best right back. Like overall, you know, in terms of every bit of the skill set, I think he's probably the best that we have. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good analysis. I think I, I agree with you on the most part. I think for me, when you when you look at Doku yesterday, running rings around here, whoever was in front of him, of course, it was as well gross, as you say. But it just felt like we were so weak on that right side from the beginning. Um, and obviously, now we can need to talk about the left side in the second half, because obviously with Solly, we'll get on to that. Um, because we, we do have a bit of a fullbacks crisis at the moment, don't we? I don't, I don't want to be completely negative, because I actually thought we were really good in that second half yesterday. But I need to get these negative talking points out of the way. Um, and, and that is, yeah, the right-back situation is a bit worrying. Left-back situation is a bit worrying. Adam, do you, do you not worry as, as such, but we do only play in a few days' time against Ajax. In most fans' opinion, this is a, is a must-win game um, to keep our European dreams alive. Um, and, and when you look at the fullback situation, it's it's not ideal, is it? No, completely not at all. And I think, to be honest, I, you know, I saw Andy Naylor write an article in midweek about how Brighton actually never needed a left back and what were they worrying about. But I actually really disagree with that. And you know, I think it was something we spoke about before the transfer window closed, Ryan. I was saying I just really would like, love to get a left back in because I just think it's it's so important. I think we're now going into a few games where we're probably going to see Veltman and Milner playing at fullback, maybe like Igor at left back, but that doesn't seem completely natural. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I think uh, it's, I find it interesting as well that kind of as soon as the season started, Deserby was keen to play Milner at right back for the first kind of few games. I remember seeing that quite a lot. Um, Veltman wasn't really playing many games and then kind of that Man United game came along I think he came in at right back Lamptey at left back so I don't know I think that there's obviously loads of changes to be made and not helped by the fact that we've got we've got now kind of three technically kind of full backs out injured uh, and a quality mm. player like Steve Pinyan as well going into Thursday it's going to be really kind of makeshift I think that back line um, which doesn't really help as you say not at all no, yeah, it's not even just so much makeshift, is it? It's the fact that we haven't got anybody at all in, uh, available to bring on, even. Yeah. So even if that makeshift doesn't work, it's you know it has to. So I think that that's the, as you said, the trouble of not signing someone in the in the summer. Obviously, we'll have a Stupinian back in a couple of weeks, which isn't so bad. But yeah, the Solly thing is a bit worrying. Um, we'll go into his injury a bit later on. Um, but we'll just talk about the end of that first half because I feel like. When, once we went two down, um, as we said, Doku was getting so much space and that's how the first goal came about. Obviously, it's how the second goal came about again. We Actually, no, it wasn't. I think it was Belaba gave it away in the end, actually, wasn't it? It wasn't, um, it wasn't any of them, anything to do with me. That's uh, very wrong. But yeah, I think it was um, Belaba gave it away. Again, it was, such a, it was such a minor mistake. And this is what we'll get on to because I feel like the goals that we actually conceded was so minor in the face of the game. I thought we actually would, they came at a time where we were actually playing quite well. Um, and then it's a little sort of bounce off his knee, isn't it, from Belaba? And if you're going to give it to Erling Haaland, just don't do it there. I mean, it's, it's really just the worst place to give something to someone who is so good and probably should be winning the Ballon d'Or. Yeah. I said it. Um, and he, yeah, he finishes it very, very well. 
Is there a bit of a suspect there, um, Louis, on Jason Steele? Not so much for the second, but the first as well. Um, there's a couple of little bits and pieces where people may be saying, now, do we just let Verbruggen v- start? Or, you know, is it is it OK with rotating to Steele? Well, I think, like, we've, we've seen that De Zerbi has made a very big point of trying to keep everyone, like, rotated with the goalkeepers. And it seems to be a thing that Steele plays away, and then you've got Verbruggen at home. I'm not quite sure why. Um, I, I, it doesn't quite clock with me, but I think it's pretty obvious to see that Verbruggen is the better keeper, and he should be the one that is starting the majority of games. I think for that second goal, to be beaten at your near post from near 25 yards like that mm. it's a little bit suspect like obviously Dunk's doing what he can to cover and block the shot but you know he's, he's hit it with a fair amount of power but you'd still expect a, a goalkeeper at this level to, to save that and yeah. you know I'm not trying to shit on Jason Steele because obviously you know he's been keeping for as long as he can remember um, and I'm not a goalkeeper mm. by any stretch mm. of the imagination but it just seems to me like it was a little bit of a a little bit of a lapse of concentration, possibly, or just the fact you know he's not got the biggest build compared to to Verbruggen, who's got much you know much bigger wingspan. Um, but yeah, you just, I I just don't think it, you should be getting beaten at that near post. And that first goal, it's a bit of a scuff from Alvarez, and it's probably thrown him off. So you probably put less blame on him for that. But yeah, I still think the second goal shouldn't really be conceded at all. The only thing I'd say about that second goal is I think you know it. It kind of came a little bit out of nowhere, and it, it's like Haaland took it so early as well. Like as soon as basically Belaba got the ball, it was probably like a couple of steps, and then bang, he yeah. just like it was outside the box. He just dri- drove it into that corner. So I don't know. I, I think I, it's interesting what you say about kind of Verbruggen and, and Steel, Louis, because like I think I saw some. Did you guys see him uh, like a couple of weeks ago where Verbruggen was doing an interview saying that like he's been told that each keeper is going to get two games at a time. So I don't know like whether that's a thing. Yeah. I mean, you're obviously saying the home and away. I don't really know. I sort of wonder whether like he's he just really trusts Steele kind of in possession in terms of how he wants kind of De Zerbi ball to play. And he kind of, that's why he's kind of keeping him around a bit longer, maybe waiting until Verbruggen's really up to speed and kind of how he wants his goalkeepers to play and then probably is his long-term number one. I don't know, but I think it's probably something that needs to be addressed in the next few months, to be honest. Yeah, is there maybe, a, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is, purely speculation and rubbish um, thinking, but maybe Verbruggen, he is only, what, 21? Um, There's probably an element of going away to City. It is a big occasion regardless. But then again, he he does start, um, you know, for for Ajax. um, Yeah, sorry, who did we sign for? Yeah, was it Ajax? Anderlecht. Who did we get him from now? Anderlecht. God, my brain this morning is absolutely fried. (laughs) I travelled back yesterday. Um, But yeah, when we signed him, he he was being tipped as being one of the best sort of young players in the world. Um, so I don't I don't quite know where the line's drawn of, you know, he's a talent, he needs to play and he needs to not play every game because it's not right to just throw him in everything. Mm. There's, there's that fine line, isn't there? And I think the Zerbi up to now has got it pretty spot on with everyone in the squad. But perhaps with Verbruggen, you would argue mm. that, yeah, maybe he just needs that little bit more game time, play him for 10 games in a row and just see what happens. And if it doesn't work, then maybe rotate it again. I don't know what you guys think on that. Yeah, I mean, I would say actually to that extent, um, you know, about giving him the experience in bigger games. Like his first start for the Netherlands senior national team was against France. You know, he conceded an absolute worldie to Kylian Mbappe, which I don't think many goalkeepers would have got to. But he's already faced, you know, one of the best players in the world in his first international start. Like if that's not being thrown in at the deep end, I don't know what is. But, you know, if he can be in that game and, and from what I saw online, people that, you know, that were following the game, fans of the Dutch national team, they were all saying that he had a good game. So yeah. I feel like he should be ready. Like I'm not saying that he has to be ready from game one or whatever, but you know, you'd expect if we're signing him with this much anticipation, the fact that he did so well playing for Anderlecht last year, you know, he was tipped as one of the best young goalkeepers in in Europe, as you said. You know, I, I feel like he should be up to speed and ready to go. So I don't know why you'd hold him off from playing against City when if you've got the chance to, to face up against Erling Haaland and maybe keep a clean sheet against him, why wouldn't you? And also all I'd yeah, say is that... A- so all I was going to quickly say was just like, Deserve is prepared to play like Belaba against City as well, who's literally 19 years old. Mm. So you, you, I'd be, I don't know, it just kind of doesn't really make sense to me why you wouldn't want to put in a young goalkeeper based on experience if you're happy to do it with other players. 
Yeah, that's pretty much what I was going to get onto is the fact that, yeah, we've done it so often with so many other players. We've done it for a good few years, even under Potter, to his credit, did it sort of with Alzate, didn't he, with Connolly, threw them in quite early, risked them quite a lot. Whether it was the right decision for Connolly's aspect, maybe not. But with Alzate, on the other hand, I thought he, he coped quite well. Um, De Zerbi's done it so regularly here. And yeah, it's a bit of one of those now where you're thinking, as I say, maybe for that next 10 game period, you just give it to Verbruggen for a bit. Just just because I think that naturally, as much as I like the diversive thinking, and this is always such a good talking point. I mean, you could probably debate this with Arsenal fans as well, with uh, obviously Raya and Ramsdale of, you know, it's it's all well and good doing this. But at some point, you know, there needs to be that, that consistency at the back. Um, you know, we've obviously had Igor rotating with Van Hecker, rotating with obviously Dunk as well when he came out of the team a couple of times. So, you know, overall we've make shifted that defence and, and that goalkeeping spot so regularly. Now without Solly, now, you know, if Altman's gonna start, if he doesn't, whatever. We've never really had that consistent defence. And obviously as everybody is the age old thing is you need a good defence to, to win everything that you want to win. So I don't know. Um I think that there's definitely a case um for, for, for starting him for a little bit longer. But yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Um we'll move on to the second half. Um because I thought after this after the you know Obviously, Milner comes off. I thought we actually played quite well. Um, v- v- um, Veltman comes on. Um, we've got a proper right back on the pitch. And I don't know. We we had a very good second half. Um, I don't know about you, Adam, but there's definitely a case to say with the amount of chances we had. I mean, obviously, you had the Matoma one a bit later on. A Matoma header as well. We had quite a few corners and free kicks, um, not to mention the Anzu goal. I think that well, they were definitely there for the taking. For hundred percent, and I think at full time that was like you could sense that a little bit towards the end, like the city fans whistling, the crowd uh, whistling to the ref, and obviously with that sending off as well, making it a little bit more hairy. Um, I think, yeah, completely. I think to, uh, my view is, I think probably City deserve to win it. I think based on that first half, like they did, just show that golfing class that they had. But like you say, like there was that gross chance as well, which I think he put into the side netting as well. And I think I think the substitutions really changed the game. Veltman was obviously able to cope with the threat that kind of eventually came with Grealish, and like he he's been you know he's done really well against Grealish in the past, particularly as well. Andy Fatty, I thought was really dynamic, a player who I think we've all been a little bit not sure of, but was really impressive going forward. Matoma, multiple times, kind of weaving through the kind of middle and over to the left, really just taking it to the to the to the Man City players. And, and there was a moment in the second half where I was just looking at Deserby, him going mental after. I think we might have even still been two 0 down. And uh, you know, it just it's typical kind of Brighton, the way we play that we're not just gonna shut up shop, we're not gonna kind of you know get demoralized. We were still playing, we were still taking it to them. And and yeah, we I mean, probably in the end, if we had scored, it wouldn't have been the most unfair thing in the world. But I think in my view, probably on balance, it was it was a fair result in the end. Ryan, you're on mute. You mean <laughs> Ryan. Do you think we had enough chances to come back into it? Sorry, I was doing a Louis there. Is that to me? I mean, I think, well, I think a problem... Is that it? Yeah, it was at Louis, don't worry. Yeah. But um, no, I think, I've, I think I've got a bit of a delay <laughs> here because everything, every single time I say something, I seem to get left <laughs> behind. But yeah, I was asking Louis if, if he thinks we had enough chances to win the game because I, I don't know, I thought, I agree with you to a degree. I thought Matoma, as you say, was very good coming forward. I thought we had quite a lot of chances, perhaps maybe not the clear-cut expected goals is going to love you sort of chances. But I definitely think, though, you know, for a Brighton side going away, I would have said that a 2-2, I don't know about you, Lou, but it was on the cards for me. I don't know. I could be I could be in delusional world. No, I, I reckon you're right there, to be honest. Like, I think the way that we played, especially in that second half, like, I know obviously Matoma in that first half, he really took it to Kyle Walker, which is not something that many players have done or can do, um, which I think is a really unique skill set of his. Um, but yeah, I think that second half we created so much. We like you said we we're never that sort of team that are just going to sit off and and let the game wilt away or try and do damage limitation or whatever like that. It's mm. it's not not the deserve way. So I think he'd rather lose like five one like we did to Newcastle last year than you know 
taking like a two 0 loss because at, at that point you know you you feel like you've not actually got no more to lose so you might as well take it to them and mm. I think that fearlessness that tenacity the way that we played in that second half it was like they must have got some sort of bollock in at half time because yeah the way they mm. came out suddenly it was a it was a whole different game and I feel like with all the opportunities that created I think I agree with you that two two would have been a very fair result I think it was just that final like cutting edge maybe as people were getting tired that maybe just stopped us from from getting that equaliser. Yeah, I do agree. I, I look back on that first half as well. Obviously, Lewis Dunk, I thought it's worth mentioning, had a, had a great game, um, a very, very good game, um, because he's, he's essentially covered that right-back spot as well. Um, I feel like every time that if it was gross, whether it was a dinger, whether it was Milner got done in that first half, Dunk was across and cleared a lot of balls out. Also, a couple of chess back to the, yeah. to the keeper, which he does so well, as everybody knows. Yeah. Um, absolutely love those. Um, but I thought Dunk was was fantastic. And going into that second half, I think if it wasn't for him, we could have been down about four or five. And again, it comes down to the same old thing of yeah. the Zerbi's football. As you say, Louis, second half coming out so strong. But this is a question to you, Adam. Why do we need to concede two goals in pretty sloppy fashion? to start playing yeah. how we know we can play because then all of a sudden we're on par with City and we're playing some of the best stuff in the league yeah. again. I mean, I don't really know. I think it would have been pretty mad if we'd been able to come out at the Etihad from minute one and like just knock the ball about the way Brighton do. Maybe, I don't know, just the kind of momentum of football, the way the game swings kind of every kind of week for every team, like you almost need to go two goals down or you need to go a goal down to kind of for the opposition to kind of maybe sit back or kind of take a bit of pressure. But I don't know. I think there's definitely a conversation to ha be had. I said it post game on, on Seagull Central about how, you know, that we need to address this issue about leaking goals. Like I think it's getting to a point now where it is just mental. Mm -hmm. Like everyone in the kind of uh, wider footballing sphere is picking up on it as well. Like we're, we're conceding a lot of goals and yes, it's city, but like, I think, uh, I don't know. It, it's just quite, it's quite irritating that we often have to kind of go a couple of goals down to then play, or you know that if we're going to win a game, we're probably going to need to score three goals to win it. Um, and I, I don't know. That's something that's worrying me a little bit, but back to Lewis Dunk. It's more the nature of the yeah, goals. Yeah, completely. Isn't it? Um, no, sorry, no, yeah. just, just on your point, it's more the mm. nature of the goals that's frustrating. It's not so much, yeah, we've conceded to City, because don't get me wrong, teams lose four or five to City weekly. Um, but these are a bit of a different City at the moment. They've lost Rodri, he comes back, and you expect them to be stronger with him. But I don't know, the, the way we conceded is what's what's bugging me, because I think that's why I'm almost on the fence of mm. saying we could we should have you know done better in that game results basis, because... You know, second half we come out and, and we looked as good as. And I think that's what's frustrating. You've had to go them two stupid goals down. A bit like how we did at Villa. A bit like how we did at Marseille. A bit like how we did even with Liverpool. I mean, that's now four games in a row where we've had to concede in, in a bad way. Louis, I don't know if you agree with that. And we'll get on to your point on Duncan in a minute. Sorry, Andy. Hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think that those those sort of early goals that we can see, that might just be, I, I don't know if you call it rust, but it's like, you know, when you, you sort of go out and you're still, maybe your head's still in a bit in the yeah. dressing room, it's so early and teams are looking to put pressure on us super early because they know that we're not fully like awake or whatever it is, ready to go. So they'll look to pounce on that opportunity really early doors and try and take us on. And I think the midfield personnel as well is going to be a big reason for that. You know, last year when we had Caicedo and McAllister to sat in front of that back four people wouldn't even dare to yeah. take us on and you saw how much more you know structurally rigid we were when we had those two in that midfield pivot but I think now you know we're persisting with Gross in a midfield two as a pivot it just doesn't work like I get that we need someone else to be in that role that we lost two of our key players and obviously it's going to be a huge void to fill and I think Belabor is getting there He's going to be that that Caicedo replacement, but we still need someone else that's going to partner him in that midfield. And I, I think we can't really persist with Gross because defensively, we know he's not sound. Like we know how good he is going forward, but there's no point putting him in that def more defensive role because it doesn't get anything out of him, and it doesn't really benefit us at all. So it puts more emphasis I think on the defenders to start doing more and like you say about Dunk I think that's probably one of the best games he's had in an Albion shirt he was unbelievable mm. yesterday and I think if it weren't for him we probably would have been five or six down mm. and the way he set up our goal like you know he he clears that off the line and then plays mm. that fizzing pass across the pitch which eventually leads to the goal like 
he's just showing his quality week in, week out. Even if he drops, like that's the thing with Dunk now. It's come to the point where if he doesn't drop like a seven or eight out of ten performance, people start saying, "Oh, he's washed. He's finished. Whatever. Mm. He's overrated." You know. But when we see him play these games, we've just become so used to him putting in such solid, really good performances that as soon as he has one that's slightly off the mark, you know, we start people start getting on his back. But we all know, as Brighton fans, just how good he is. And like yesterday, against arguably the best team in the world, he showed just like his incredible qualities. Like For me, this might be a bit of a bold shout. I don't know, this might end up going viral on social media or whatever. But I don't care at this point. I'm putting him, genuinely, at, at the stage he's in, with the form he's in, I'm putting him as one of the top five centre-backs in the Prem. Well, I think that's really At this current stage. At that's fair at the moment. With all the qualities he possesses, with, yeah... Yeah, with all the qualities he possesses, I don't see any reason why you could argue against that, to be honest. Yeah, no, it's fair enough. I mean, Adam, you had a point on Dunk, actually, and on Louis' point as well. As I say, he's, he's been so good. Is is it almost, he's gone to England and he seems to have gone up another level, hasn't he? I don't know if that's maybe just me thinking about it, but he seems to have come back even more mature and even sort of I think stronger that, I think than he ever that was. that point is he? definitely true. I think, he, I remember when he got his first call, was it maybe 2018 or something, and he didn't obviously get a call up with Ink again then, again then for years. And I remember reading a piece, I think, in The Athletic, and they were saying that it was because his level of... Gareth Southgate essentially wasn't that impressed with his level of training compared to kind of the other elite players that were in the England squad. And I think it's quite interesting now. He's clearly just a few years on. We all thought he was amazing back in 2018. He's taken that game to that really elite Premier League level now. Brighton are, I think, an elite kind of side within the Premier League. Um, playing some of the best football and he's obviously gone to that England camp and realised he you know he is one of the best defenders there he's one he's a, he's a quality player within that team and um, he's playing like he's playing the, with, that, with that kind of arrogance of a player who knows he's absolutely quality and in his later years now much more mature can read the game a lot better and what I was going to say was essentially what Louis said about you know with, with the goal you know it was an amazing block on the line or you know chesting it on the line or whatever but loads of players then would have just like lumped it up. They're under pressure. Dunk picks out a perfect ball into midfield, fizzes it into, I can't remember who, let's say Matoma or someone. And suddenly the attack gets going again. And I think it's, he's got so many kind of strings to his bow, you know, defensively blocks, awareness, you know, to read the game, you know, technically been able to play the ball as well. I think he's, he, I completely agree with you. I think he's one of the top centre-halves in the league, 100%. Yeah, and <laughs> and I might even do you one better to be fair, because I feel like I feel like he's been there for a while. I think I I I remember saying this in the twenty twenty one season and really going on about it for the Euros, really going on about it, saying I really thought he was he that was his moment. Um, I thought he, his Lewis Dunk twenty twenty one was very very strong, and I feel like in twenty twenty three, two years later. If if you're judging it on FIFA, he should be getting worse. <laughs> but if you're judging it in real life, it's really quite the opposite. Um, yes, I do agree with you. I think he's been fantastic. And yesterday, as you say, probably one of his best games. And it was it was more to the fact he was just covering for them two positions, which was so impressive. He's done it so often before anyway. Um, but because he's had to account, obviously, mm. there. And then, obviously, we'll get on to this now, but Solly's injury, um, it looked nasty. I couldn't work out if it was a knee or if it was an ankle Certainly his legs sort of bent inwards, which is never a good sign. Um, we, I think he was in tears as well as he came off the pitch. And a lot of rumours that Roberto De Zerbe went straight down the tunnel. Um, quite to my frustration at first until I realised he went down apparently to, to Solly March and check on him straight away, um, which is apparently a very nice thing. I don't know if that's true, probably is. Um, but yeah, um, Solly, what a shame that is. I mean, seriously, what a shame that is. It sounded very sarcastic. He's He's been so good for us for such a long time now. He's been on our right side, on our left side, and now sort of playing left back as cover for Estupinha and still putting in such good performances against uh, top sides. And um, it's just, I don't know what's going to happen to him. Hopefully it's not as bad as first feared. Although in my unfortunate opinion, it's probably going to be a long one. Um, and we've already discussed the issues going forward, but Solly himself, um, Louis, it's, it's a, a massive shame, isn't it? Uh, to put it lightly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've always been a big fan of Solis. Like, he's been Mr. Consistent, I think, for so many years. Like, he's never been 
one of those players that, you know, if he gets played out of position, he's going to throw a hissy fit and re- refuse to play or whatever. You know, he's always, he's got, he's got his head down and works and trained harder, played in whatever position, whichever manager it is, has requested him to play in. You know, he's, he's played pretty much along both wings for, you know, every single manager that he's played for. You know, he's played as a wing back, he's played as a winger. I think he even played as a bit of a centre forward back when we were in the championship for a few games. Like, he's just been everywhere across the pitch and he's so versatile and he's been able to ad- adapt and adjust over these, you know, last uh, 10 years that he's been with us, like playing solidly in the first team. It's been amazing to watch, and then, like, as you say, like having to cover for a Stupinian, it's not an it's it's a big pair of boots to fill. Like Stupinian's one of the best in the league at left back, to have to step into that position against arguably the best club team in the world, it's a huge ask. Um, and the fact that you know he took to the job so well, and he kept you know kept Phil Foden so quiet. We were talking about Foden's qualities earlier like just how good of a player he is and he brings something very unique to the game something that like you say Bellingham doesn't quite do but the you know he kept kept Foden so quiet throughout that first half and actually through the second half as well but then to have him that having that injury is just heartbreaking mm-hmm. because you know he's worked so hard and he's like you say he's come so far with us to then have that setback again after what happened at the end of last season it's really, really tough. And, you know, hopefully it's not a huge setback, like in terms of how long he's going to be out for. But it's just adding to that injury crisis, especially in that fullback position. Yeah. Um, Adam, any any words yeah, I mean, on, just, on Solly? Well, firstly, kind of best of luck with the recovery. I think to me and everything I've seen, I think, I think it just looks like an ACL, to be honest. I think it looks like his knee and it just, yeah, I don't know, I think it's probably going to be like nine, nine, Months. And you've seen what happened to Jakob Moda as well with that injury as well. So it's just horrible to, to have another player get that injury because who knows what we might not see him. I think just touching on what you guys said, I think it's been so good to see him be able to do that job at left back so easily. Of course, he did it under Potter and he was playing that left wing back role. And, you know, it was nice when Deserbi came in that he got kind of reinstated to right wing again, given the number seven shirt and kind of really given that faith to kind of go and kind of try and be a top winger in this league and he was getting to a stage where you know he probably wasn't quite at the England call-up kind of level but he was certainly in the conversation like probably behind like someone like Bowen in that kind of conversation so mm. you know it's yeah he was, it's, he it was. is really sad to see and I'll be honest you know let's say what maybe 10 years ago maybe maybe a bit less than that like I was probably a bit of a Solly Marks critic when we were in the championship and when he was coming through and I did yeah, <laughs> probably two years ago. I, was just totally right I just thought he was very, either. very one-footed and often didn't have that confidence to like go and take players on. You know, in the same way that we see kind of now Matoma is comfortable with doing. And I often wanted him to kind of have a bit more to his game. But I think in these last few years, probably really since Potter's left, actually, mainly the last year or so, he's really taken that game to the other level. He's been given that license to just go and attack and uh, take players on. How does Erby like to play? And he's just given them that confidence. I think it's so sad to see. Mm. And you think as well, he's what, 28 now maybe? You know, probably, you know, it's good that he could play that left-back role because as he goes into his 30s, he's, you know, he probably could have done a job for us at left-back going forwards or, you know, for the rest of his career, maybe ended up playing at left-back. And such a versatile player, such a quality player at a really good point in his career at the moment. So it would be a real stinger if he, if he, was to be out for let's say a year yeah it's always that worry isn't it at this age isn't it because you're you're sort of just going past just your, your prime era then you're going towards that sort of yeah that then 30s and obviously if you get an acl injury and you're going into your 30s it's it's never a good sign um and yeah we can only hope really that solly's injury doesn't stop him from playing at the top level because so often you can see that at this sort of stage in his career where you know, sometimes it can keep you up for a long time and you, you never really recover from it. But um, hopefully, hopefully that's not the case. And as you mentioned, actually, the 10 years thing of Solly is insane. I was only saying this to my family yesterday. It's really weird um, how mm. he's been here for so long because we still sort of look at him as as being our, our little star boy um, coming up through the academy. And when he scored against Norwich in a yeah. friendly, we thought, oh, my God, we've got a proper player on our hands. And 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 now it's it's yeah he's he's been there for ten years he's established himself in the squad um, to which he's had a lot of criticism including from myself and I, I've always as I said as you said as well Adam 
that, that one footed thing, not scoring enough goals, not getting enough assists. And, you know, to be a winger in the, in the top level, you have to have goals and assists as much as it's annoying. Um, and he added that to his game and, and, and did it very, very well under the Zerbi. So it's, it's such a shame it's come at this time. Um, and especially for for the Brighton's sake, and uh, you know, and the fact we haven't actually got a fit left back um, anymore. So going into that Ajax game is going to be very tough. But if <laughs> I was to just lighten the mood slightly, uh, obviously we do wish Solly all the best in his recovery, um, and hopefully, yeah, this isn't as deep as bad as we think it's going to be. But we never know. Um, unfortunately, with the injury crisis in this club, historically. Um, Ansu Fati, as you mentioned, uh, that goal uh, was it was a good goal, but more to the fact I actually thought he was really good when he came on, um, and actually um, for the f- probably the second time I'd say I really saw Ansu's quality. Um, you know, we 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 yet to really see it, are we? That, that that star, star, star quality that we know he's had at Barcelona for such a long time. But uh, I don't know about you, Louis, but he's almost I wouldn't say he's anywhere near there yet. But we're starting to see the extra ten percent every single week he comes off from the bench. Mm, I think so. I think it's just a case of, you know, you're getting settled in in a completely new environment. You know, he's been playing at Barcelona where they're almost expected to win the league title, but he has so many quality players around him, like genuine world-class players that he can just relax a bit more and be himself. And I'm not saying that our team is, you know, massively far off the the quality that Barcelona possess, but, you know, when you come into this brand new environment, it's a different situation that you're playing in. I know Xavi's tactics are very much, you know, you work around, you play the ball a lot. It's very much the classic Barca style, which would suit, you know, I think it would suit Ansu Fati for sure. But, you know, you're coming into an environment with players with different qualities that you're you're having to adjust to and that's not something that you know anyone can just immediately do from from day one unless you are one of the best in the world so I think you know we we got to give him that leeway I think essentially but when he plays with confidence I think this is something I saw on a few uh, videos like compilations of mm-hmm. when you see Ansu Fati playing with confidence he looks unbelievable and mm-hmm. we saw that when he was at Barcelona and there's a reason that he was given the number 10 shirt at Barca you know mm-hmm. he's got so much quality he's got so much talent and so much potential that as long as we give him the time And, you know, as long as, you know, he's allowed to have that freedom, I think the freedom is the main thing. And working off another striker, someone who's an actual number nine, who's happy to just work off him, you know, play with him. I think when he Mm. plays alongside Pedro, like if Pedro's ahead of him or he's ahead of Pedro, it doesn't quite work because they're actually quite similar kinds of players. Um, I prefer him through the middle for sure. But when he's got a Ferguson ahead of him or a Welbeck, like that, um, the first half against Marseille, The way he worked with Welbeck, and and granted Welbeck didn't have the best game there either, but... You know, when he worked off Welbeck in that first half, it it worked so, so well. And again, it was that issue with going down two goals early, but he was electric in that match. And he was mm. one of our best players, I think, against Marseille. And like I said, when he came on against, um, against City yesterday, it was so much more energy. You know, he looked like he had a little bit more freedom going into that game. And this is against a really, really good team. You know, if he carries on playing with that level of confidence, who knows what we'll see out of him. Yeah. Adam, do you... I'm not so much putting him on the on the pressure of being like he was when he was, you know, obviously one of the best regarded talents in the world. But I mean, to see even sixty percent of that, what we saw for his Barca career, is going to probably be oh. one of the best we've ever seen here. Um, which goes to show the sort of quality that he has. Um, which deserve he's gone on about it so much, you know. He, and I, I do agree with him. You know, these players need time. You know, you can't just put Anzu Fati in and expect him to play as Ansu Fati did. Um, you know, he's had that big injury. He's obviously had his setbacks as well, not not coming back into the team as quickly as maybe he'd hoped to. Um, and even um, some reports coming out from Barcelona in, 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 since the summer saying that they'd be happy to sell him at the end of this season, you know, if he, if he plays well here. Um, and then much to the the links that followed it of them wanting Matoma. So I could probably see where that one's going. Um, but we won't talk about that bit yet. <laughs> but Anzu Fati, Adam, he's starting to show it, isn't he? I mean, I thought yesterday was probably the brightest spark and has a genuine case to say, I should yeah, be starting against like, Ajax. He, he, I think he was an element as to why our game changed in the second half. As I said before, him and Veltman, I think, were, were really fundamental in that. Um, I think, you know, you, you wouldn't... If, if he was playing at the level he could play at, 
you know, and he was coming straight into Brighton, playing at the level he could play. He probably wouldn't be at Brighton. So I think we kind of had to expect that he was going to come and maybe be a little bit rusty, be a bit tentative in the way yeah. he's playing. Obviously, coming back from an injury, maybe trying to get used to things a little bit, getting used to a new league, a new manager, a manager who you know, notoriously kind of demands a lot from his players. And you have to almost learn a whole new system of football. Under, as Levi Cole said, you have to understand football in a completely different way under the Zerbi. So it's, 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 you know, him coming mm. in immediately, particularly when you're playing up front and it's difficult and you've got to try and link with players. It's hard. It's not as simple as that. And, you know, coming on kind of as a sub at Villa, yeah. I can't remember, or, you know, wherever. It's kind of, it's a tough gig at times. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. you know, I think we've yeah. definitely seen the best of it. I think yesterday was probably the kind of most encouraged I've seen in terms of seeing it. Um, and I think going into going into let's say Thursday night, I think for me, him and Ferguson as a kind of ten and number nine, I think that that's long term something I really like. Obviously, Pedro is quality, and I think there's definitely place for him as well. But I agree with your point, Louis, that they can't both play together. I think you need to have one or the other because they're too similar. Yeah, no, I do, I do agree with you. Um, I, I, I also I sort of echo your points really on, on Ansu. I think. Yeah, he he showed me a lot. I think uh, last couple of games, he's he's really given me a lot more confidence. I think I put a tweet out actually during that Marseille game, saying you know, Ansu Fati's clearly clearly quality. I think it was that header he had that really like he forced that world class save, and I thought, oh, okay, right, it, not many players can just header a ball like that at about <laughs> five foot six. <laughs> and I'm joking, I'm actually now tall here, but he seems quite short. Uh, <laughs> very rich coming from me. I'm very sorry, um, but yeah, he. <laughs> yeah, <still> <laughs> yeah. five for eight mate come on um but yeah I thought um after that I thought yeah you can definitely see his class he had a couple of touches didn't he I think it was against Athens um you can just see them little bits of quality um and I, and I want to see it more and I think we are starting to see it more without putting too much pressure on the kid because you do forget he's only 20 years old with the amount he's achieved um at such a young age um just on your point on Jao Pedro um I, he wasn't the best yesterday obviously I, I like Jao Pedro a lot um, probably didn't have his best game and he would admit it. Um, what do you think we need from Pedro? Because we had this discussion with, with Ben and Maz. His goal return isn't the best, um, but he's he's very good on the spot. Um, he, his link-up play is getting better. Obviously, he was the captain at, at Watford as well. So he's he's had a, a very good career up until only 21, which is quite mad. He, you know, he captained his side when he came over to England, which is a huge achievement. Um, I don't know what you think, Louis. Where where he gets his goals from or if he should be just maybe playing in that deeper role. I, I, where do you see Jao Pedro as, as the best Jao Pedro and where we can really see him flourish? See, I personally think we've got so much, we're so now stacked in those attacking areas, like through the middle, out towards the left. Maybe not so much on the right. Maybe there's a space for him on the right, but I don't really know if that really suits his game particularly. I know he likes to take people on one-on-one. But I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that's quite where he would thrive. I feel like he has a potential to just be an out and out nine because we've seen, you know, some of his finishing has been a little bit questionable. But when he's in that pressure situation, like taking those penalties, he is ice cold. Yeah. Absolutely ice cold. And if he can just refine his finishing ever so slightly, give him the freedom to be that nine who just attacks the spaces and gets those, those clinical finishes in. You know, that's that's going to be huge for us going forward if we've got the rotation of being able to have Ferguson and Jao Pedro as those reliable number nines who can get you goals at any time in any situation. I think that will be huge for us. And if we do end up signing Antti Fatley on a permanent, I, I'm not sure I can see it happening unless we get some sort of deal with Barcelona for Mitoma. Like... <laughs> It might be possible. And that even <laughs> might give Ansu Fati the freedom to be starting on the left and then maybe Jao Pedro can then retake that number 10 spot. Who knows? There's all sorts of things to take into consideration here. But I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I feel like Pedro has the potential to be an out and out number nine. But there's been a few times I've seen him attempt to finish and it's been, I can't remember which game it it's was, that he scuffed one over the bar from very close. Yeah. It was yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, tough. I agree. Um, yeah, Pedro's Pedro's an interesting player. Um, I I like him a lot. I think his work rate's very very good for a sort of a, a forward yeah. player. He comes back very deep. Um, I think it was against the game before the break, which was Liverpool, and he sort of tracked back a good sixty yards, didn't he? And and they really closed down his man. I think it was um, Shobosly or someone like that. And he, and he I think he 
literally travel the length of the pitch just to put a challenge in. And I think those sort of things he's so good at. He's got really, really good characteristics of a potential midfielder, um, um, sort of a, a, an attacking midfielder. Um, my question is, yeah, whether he's got that ability to start finishing them chances. Maybe if he starts them, you know, them running in behind you know, a couple more times than he is already, um, then perhaps we could see a little bit better. But um, I don't know. We'll see. I think what, what's good to take away from not only this podcast, but watching Brighton in general is yeah. it's all just a work in progress. It's just a, literally a work in progress. We've got, we're talking about a 21-year-old, Jao Pedro. We're talking about a 20-year-old, Anzu Fati. Then we've obviously got the Lewis Dunk, who is now 32, but only just going out to England and getting his new experience. And it's, it's, such, a, it's such a work in progress of a squad that um, it's really hard to just start judging. I mean, Matoma might be 26, but it's only his second year for us uh, in, in, the top, in the top flight of English football. Um, so it's a it's a it's a mad thing, really, isn't it? I don't know if you've got any any other final words, Adam, on um, the work in progress that is Brighton and and, and Roberto De Zerbi as well. Actually, is worth noting. Completely, the, you know, we, we've we've brought in a lot of players in the summer. We've lost a couple of really cute, crucial players. So I think it was always going to be a massive challenge going into this season without, like I say, and McAllister, for example. Um, so I think I think there has to be a level of expectation when we're playing so many more games. We're in European football. We were fighting in kind of four competitions at the start of the season. It was always going to be a lot more difficult. And I think it takes yeah. time for players to adapt. We're literally having to revamp a whole midfield. We can't expect Belayba to be Caicedo literally overnight. We can't expect we can't expect Andy yeah, Fatty to one. be a world beater yeah. overnight. Jao Pedro is coming up from a, a literally different league to come into European football. So. I think there's definitely a work in progress here. And I think I'm quite encouraged by the fact that I, I do genuinely think De Zerbi is here, you know, not for the long term, but I think he'll be here beyond the summer. I think he'll be here this time next year. And I think there is a bit more of a long term kind of vision with this team. And I think I think we're in a really, really good place just because we're in a spell where we're conceding quite a lot of goals and we're playing some difficult teams at the moment. You know, it doesn't mean everything's awful. I think we're actually pretty good, Nick. Barring injuries, we've got CISO to come back in the next few weeks. We saw him speak yesterday on the TikTok live saying he's going to be back in December. Yeah. So there are things to be positive about. Um, and it's a massively exciting mm-hmm. season. So, yeah. Yeah, I know. I do. I do agree with you. I think we're almost victims of our own of our own success, aren't we, really, where we sell all these players for a large amount of money. It instantly puts pressure on the new replacements. Another young player at Brighton. He must be the next world beater. Um, and then when he isn't, he doesn't have a good game. He's being called out on Twitter. We've never been quite in that situation before um, of, of, you know, extreme sort of social media clout and, and, and sort of extreme views towards all of our players. It's always been that we've been the irrelevant teams like Brighton. It's, it's really changed in that last year that now we're the development club. But I think if you were to understand the game and watch Brighton and watch everything about this squad, it's clearly not ready. It's clearly not ready for, um, you know, just for Matoma to leave, just for Anzu Fati to go back to Barca, just for De Zerbi to go take over at City. All three of those things won't work. And I think if, if people can't see that, then they don't understand football. And that's just my opinion. Because Brighton are very, very, very much a work in progress. A lot of these players can't just leave and improve. You saw Robert Sanchez <laughs> yesterday, great assist for Declan Rice. Because it isn't just like you can just yeah. go and be better because you aren't. Um, <laughs> sorry, BHA Harvey, I had to call you out there, son. <laughs> um, and yeah, anyway, that's that's about it uh, from us, I think. Um, unless there's any other um, talking points which I've missed, I could have done, but I don't think I have. I mean, what I mean, the- um, don't think so. But I, I'd like to just say, you know, Go on. yeah. Um, no, I was just thinking, like, if you if you think about how. I don't actually think we've really got our second gear this year. Like we yeah. haven't been playing well in a lot of the games. And despite that, we're still getting some unbelievable results. So if we're playing at this level right now, when we're not even doing that well, just mm. imagine how good we're going to be when we start taking it up a notch. Yeah, like no, we will be one of the, one of the best teams in the league because when we are on, on song, we look unbeatable, genuinely unbeatable. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Um, it's a good way to end it as well. Billy mm-hmm. Gilmore, uh, I need him back in that 11, if I'm honest with you. I, I need to see him alongside Carlos Belaber. Um, I want to see that duo because I think it's a potentially a very good one. Um, but yeah, thank you boys for joining me. I think we'll just finish on, obviously, the sad news. Um, I don't want to just talk, bring the mood down again, but obviously Sir Bobby Charlton, I know it's not Brighton related, but did sadly pass away. Aged 86, wasn't he? Um, absolute icon for the game. I think it would be wrong to do a podcast and not give tribute to an icon for the sport um, and just someone that's, yeah, revolutionised the game, obviously, in the Munich disaster as well for Manchester United. It's, it's an incredible story that he had and, um, and, and the way it's sort of impacted the footballing world um, since, I think it was about half-time yesterday, which was mad. Um, but, yeah. Full full um, yeah. respect to him and his family and everybody involved as well with them, all his football clubs, etc. Um, so I'll be with Charlton. What, what a man he was. Um, anyway, on that note, um, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And also comment comments below. Um, probably do something Bobby Charlton related <laughs> now. I've sort of probably got to. Yeah. Um, so anything you want. Put, yeah. put, put, a, put a blue heart in the chat and also I want to hear some thoughts as well on any of the talking points that you've picked up from the pod today um, but yeah thank you boys for joining me we'll see you probably just before Ajax hopefully Ben and Maz will be on this podcast but no guarantees uh, until then <laughs> we'll see you very soon and yeah, uh, yeah goodbye